It's known for his ability to track and capture wild animals. One day, he comes across a wounded and helpless animal in, in the forest. And instead of shooting or trapping the animal, the hunter decides to rescue it and to, to nurse it back to health. He provides it with shelter, with food, and with care until it recovers. As time goes by, the animal begins to trust the hunter and forms a bond with them. It no longer sees him as a threat, but as a provider and a protector. And eventually, the animal undergoes a remarkable transformation. Its wild instincts are tamed, and it becomes gentle and, and obedient. The animal, once wounded and lost, has been regenerated by the hunter's care and, and love. And now, for the sake of the illustration, the wounded animal, and though this illustration falls short of it, that wounded animal would represent a person who is lost in sin and separated from God. The hunter symbolizes God who seeks out and rescues those who are spiritually dead in their sin. Through God's grace and love, the person is regenerated, transformed from a state of spiritual brokenness to one of newness of life. You know, that is regeneration in a nutshell. And that is exactly what we're going to be, be putting under the microscope today as we continue our study on the, the work of the Holy Spirit in this church age of grace, or as this uh, section of our study states, the Holy Spirit and the present. You'll note that at the top of your notes, the Holy Spirit and the present. We've worked our way now into this third section. We're going to be spending quite a bit of time here on this third section uh, in this study, but in our time together, we're going to discover here that regeneration refers to the spiritual rebirth that takes place in a person's life through the work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be uh, putting that regeneration under that work of regeneration under the microscope, and we're going to hopefully gain a, a better understanding, get a better grasp as to what this work of the Holy Spirit is. We need to keep in mind that this is a work of the Holy Spirit that takes place in the lives of those who responded to the gospel of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So in our last lesson, we were able to reflect on the Holy Spirit's ministry as he permanently indwells every believer in this church age of grace. And as we've started this section, we have seen and will continue to see the work of the Holy Spirit within the lives of believers. Now, through my extensive study on the Holy Spirit's work in the lives of believers, I've identified five significant assessments that can be applied to four main ministries of the Holy Spirit within the believer's life. And when I talk about the four main ministries of the Holy Spirit, uh, we've taken some time to, to study some of those out. We're going to continue to study these out uh, but the ones that I'm referring to are the indwelling, regenerating, sealing, and baptism work of the Holy Spirit. In our next lessons, we're going to see the sealing of the Holy Spirit. What is the sealing of the Holy Spirit? Scripture talks about that. The baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We see the work of Spirit baptism in the New Testament. What is, what is that about? We're going to uh, spend some time unpacking that for you. Uh, as we move along. But in our time, just, just briefly, I want to start out with five significant assessments of these four main ministries. Again, the four main ministries are the indwelling, regenerating, sealing, and baptism work of the Holy Spirit. Five significant assessments. If you can get these, they will be helpful to you as we work our way through uh, this series. So the first significant assessment is that most of these divine works transpire among all that are saved. Most of these divine works transpire among all that are saved. The reason why I say most is because of the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. These uh, significant assessments do not apply to the filling ministry. They only apply to the indwelling, regenerating, sealing, and baptism ministries of the Holy Spirit within the life of the believer. So hopefully that's that's clear to us that, this, that these five significant assessments apply to those four main ministries, the indwelling, regenerating, sealing, and baptism work of the Holy Spirit. By the way, we are going to get to the filling ministry as well, but that'll be down the road. All right, second significant assessment is most of these divine works occur at one salvation. Most of these divine works 
occur at one's salvation. Again, this is true of the indwelling, regenerating, sealing, and baptism works of the Holy Spirit. The third assessment, the third significant assessment, is that most of these divine works will never be repeated in a believer's life. Most of these works will never be repeated in a believer's life. For instance, for instance there are not multiple ways in which one regenerates. We're going to dive into that today. In the eyes of God, there are two types of people. Those who are born once, dead in their sin. Uh, bo- those who are born twice, given new life in, in Christ. The fourth significant assessment is that most of these divine works transpire only once in a believer's life. Most of these divine works transpire only once in a believer's life whereas the filling of the holy spirit it takes place that takes place multiple times the regenerating work of the holy spirit takes place only once and uh, that brings us to our fifth significant assessment most of these divine works establish eternal life for the believer In each of these ministries, it would be unbiblical to suggest that the Holy Spirit would reverse his work within the life of the believer. Just as there is no such thing as the unsealing, the unindwelling, or the unbaptism of the Spirit in the believer's life. If the believer could lose his or her salvation, then then that fact alone would support the undoing of these ministries concerning the Spirit of God. So then the notion that you can lose your salvation, quite frankly, is an assault on the doctrine of salvation, but it is also an assault on the work of the Holy Spirit and His ministries. But our goal today is not to uh, discredit the heresy of the possibility that you can lose your salvation. That's not what this time is about. No, our goal is going to be to unpack this work of the Holy Spirit, the unregenerating work of that he has in the believer's life. And as we begin, we're going to unpack this ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're going to find out in our time together five aspects that relate to the regenerating ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're going to spend most of our time there. Those five aspects that relate to the regenerating ministry of the Holy Spirit. That brings us to the first aspect, its importance upon mankind. Its importance upon mankind. Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer commented on the importance of regeneration. Personally, I love what he said. He states here, Before the kingdom of God may be entered by a fallen individual from the human sphere, there must be a God-wrought metamorphosis in the form of a birth from above. Well, why is this work of the Holy Spirit so important upon mankind? Well, the word regenerate, that word, it means to give birth or to life. We might also say rebirth. The only way a fallen individual can enter into the presence of God is through this spiritual regeneration. So this is a very important subject to understand and to grasp as much as we can. And the passages that connect this work of the Holy Spirit to the believer can be found in two main passages. There are two main passages. The first main passage is found in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. And the second main text is found in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Both of these passages directly connect the Holy Spirit's involvement within the work of spiritual regeneration. So they are very important passages of Scripture in our time together that we're going to, that we're going to see. In fact, the Apostle John is the New Testament writer who places a strong emphasis on this concept of new life. And and he derives his ideas from the teachings of Christ. The Apostle John refers to this concept of spiritual rebirth when he writes in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They were born of God. It's this message of rebirth that he he touches on. Another main text is obviously found in John chapter 3, where Jesus is with Nicodemus. 
But then he also develops a spiritual work throughout 1 John. Remember the emphasis for the Gospel of John. It's on fellowship, right? The Gospel of John? No, it's on salvation. The purpose statement for the Gospel of John towards the end of the book, where John admits that he writes so that, that those who would read it might believe the purpose statement is back there. However, in 1 John, the context is fellowship. Yet John reflects on the spiritual work as well. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, he writes, John writes, Beloved, let, let us love one another, for love is from God, and, and everyone who loves is born of God and, and knows God. In uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, we also read, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So the Apostle John, he's touching on regeneration. He's speaking to this. He's using this terminology. They are born of God, born of God. You see that. And also in chapter 5, verse 4, we also, he, he would also write, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So the Apostle John, he really ran around this teaching in his writing, but again, he developed it from the teachings of Christ. So if Christ spoke to it, which we'll find in, in John chapter 3, if the Apostle John reaffirmed its work in the believer's life, and if Paul would write about it, then there is no doubt in my mind that this is a very important concept to grasp and understand in the mind of God. Which brings us to the second main aspect of this work of regeneration that takes place in the life of the believer. It's impartation of new life. It's impartation of new life. Now, this uh, second reality, it really speaks to the process of regeneration. Schaefer again states this, in the, in the stupendous task of preparing and qualifying fallen earthly beings for the company of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the partaking of the divine nature of the impartation of the very life of God is one of the most important features of the whole transforming undertaking. And Schaefer does not suggest that we have, through the process of regeneration, become divine. That's not what he's saying, but rather that we have been transformed, that we've been transformed. Well, what did we receive apart from Christ? Apart from Christ, the wages of sin being what? Apart from Christ, death, separation from God. What have we been given? Because of Christ, new life. Do you realize that there are at least 85 New Testament passages declaring that a believer is a changed person by, the, by virtue of the fact that he has received the very life of God? Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the what? The life. He said, I am the life. Then he goes on in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus would say, I have come that they might have life. That they might have life. The problem is, this is a, a spiritual subject, all right? We're looking, we're studying something that can't be seen. And with that, that lends itself over to confusion. So I want to go back to John chapter 3. If you would turn with me there, John chapter 3, Jesus is found speaking with Nicodemus, as Chafer calls him, the very flower of Judaism. He's a religious teacher who could only grasp the words of Jesus Christ from a visible, physical realm. Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right at the very beginning, chapter 3. John chapter 3, and we'll pick it up, verse 3. Let's read together. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, you need to be born again. He's saying you need to be born again. And Nicodemus is fascinated by this teaching, but he misses in his understanding of it as to what Jesus is saying. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a, a second time into the mother's womb and be born, can he? So what's Nicodemus' understanding here? He's picking this up, this teaching from Christ, and he understands it from a 
physical perspective when he asks the question, how can anyone enter their mother's womb a second time? Are you crazy? Right? That's kind of where he goes with that. Now, if Jesus was speaking from the standpoint of a physical perspective, then you could make the case potentially that Jesus has gone mad a bit here. However, if Jesus is in fact speaking from a spiritual perspective, then the meaning of the conversation changes entirely. Jesus hasn't lost his mind. On the contrary, what he is teaching here is incredibly important. Again, in the eyes of God, there are those who are born once, who are enslaved to Satan, sin, and death. And then those who are born a second time. John chapter 3, verse 6, we read, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So then, how does this new birth come about? Well, it comes about by the Holy Spirit, which is what Jesus says at the end of verse 8. Now, bring it down with me, verse 8. I want us to note this. Very important verse. John chapter 3, verse 8. We see the connection of the Holy Spirit's work in this regeneration process that takes place in the life of the believer here. Verse 8 says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. This is a spiritual rebirth that Jesus is alluding to, and it transpires, it transpires by the Holy Spirit. Re- regeneration, or sp- sp- spiritually being born again, is a work of the Spirit. Like when the work is invisible, it takes place according to the the will of God, and it's unpredictable, right? It's impossible to know where the wind will go um, or or what it will do. I remember my first year at Frontier School of the Bible. You know, the last thing I was planning on was getting saved in my dorm. I didn't plan on that. I thought I was saved. Yet there was an invisible spiritual work that transpired in my life. I was born again. The Spirit of God produces a new birth that gives us a new life, and that new life is in Jesus Christ. So what has happened? The old things have passed away, right? Behold, new things have come. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. By the way, uh, before we do funerals here at our church, Pastor Brad and I always pray for the family. We're praying for those who have not trusted Christ. The gospel will be shared. If people can get saved at Bible school, which they do, they can get saved at funerals. They can. Well, that leads us to our third aspect, and that relates to the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And it's grand responsibility. It doesn't rest with you and I. It rests with God. It's grand responsibility rests with God. Up to this point, we've seen that this regenerating work upon mankind is exceptionally important. We've also seen that the process of regeneration is spiritual rather than physical. But like the wind, we also find that God is over this work in an incredible way. In John chapter 1, verse 13... John chapter 1, verse 13, really drives home that point. Uh, We looked at that verse already under our first aspect where we very clearly saw that it was the Apostle John who mentions this concept of being born again over any of the other apostles. But what we can also glean from that verse is simply this, that when it comes to the work of regeneration, the responsibility lies with God over mankind. We cannot earn it. It is a, a, a work of God. Again, John chapter 1, verse 13. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Regeneration is something that's not earned. I am not regenerated or born again by anything that I have done in my own effort. I was not born again by being a quote-unquote good person in my own estimation. I was born again after I responded to faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, uh, again, does so well with this subject. I, I love what he, what he writes here. 
Life's varying experience may present immediate problems, but the essential factors of salvation, preservation, and eternal glory are his to accomplish and are never made to depend upon human success, achievement, or merit. Please turn with me to Titus. Let's go there. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. That was our second main text as we see the Holy Spirit's work in, in this work of regeneration. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. So you got Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, Titus, chapter 3, verse 5. This is a work of God. Take note of it. Chapter 3, verse 5 says, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, deeds which we have done in, in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Again, the context here is what? It's salvation. The, the, the second main passages, the, the two main passages that connect this work of regeneration to the Holy Spirit here is Titus chapter 3, verse 5, as well as John chapter 3, verse 8. Both of these passages very clearly teach that the Holy Spirit is dynamically involved in this process of rebirth. And if you remember from Lesson 4, we, we touched a bit on uh, regeneration. It's worth uh, mentioning again that in both of these verses, in both Titus chapter 3, verse 5, as well as in John chapter 3, verse 8, there is only one Greek verb mentioned in those verses. In John chapter 3, verse 8, the verb mentioned is in the perfect tense, and in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, there's a verb there, and it's in the aorist tense, signifying to the original audience that this work of regeneration is not a process, it is an event. When someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, th that is an event in more ways than one. In fact, I think we should have a party when someone comes to faith in Christ. We should. Regeneration is not something that is felt. It is something that is a fact, which should lead to producing fruit. It doesn't always lead to producing fruit, but it should. What type of a fact is this? Well, it's a biblical fact, a, a promise by God. By the way, this event doesn't ever cease to be, nor is it shoved under the rug if certain conditions are not met in the life of the believer. Can you imagine an in the spiritual sense, some being born over and over again, then losing that rebirth only to be reborn a second time or a third time, perhaps a tenth time, that's not what Jesus teaches. He doesn't teach that. But it's essentially what some believe who take the position that you can lose your salvation. The context of John 3, 8 and Titus 3, 5 is without a doubt salvation. Did you catch that? The context of those two main passages. It's not fellowship. It's salvation. We need to take note of that. Pentecost made a great observation. He writes this. As you had absolutely nothing to do with your own human conception, parental development, and physical birth, you have nothing to do with your spiritual birth. As you were born into this world through the, the act of others, so you are born into the family of God by the action of another. Only the Spirit of God can give life to that which was dead, can take that one who was without life and recreate him so that he becomes a son of God. He saved us, brother, sister, in Christ. He saved us not on the basis of the good works that we have done, nor by the prayers of those around us. We are saved by his mercy, by the work of the Holy Spirit in renewing us, giving us new life. So what does this mean for us who have been made new? Well, that brings us to the fourth aspect, which relates to this regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. It's meaning for its recipients. Simply put, what does this mean for you and I? Looking at this, studying regeneration today, what does this mean for us? Well, by any means, this fourth aspect should not be confined to a point in Sunday school. I want to encourage us this week. Let's revel in that marvelous fact that we've been saved, not by anything that we've done. We, we need to do that. We need to come back to that time and time again. We've been saved by God's mercy, by his grace. Just amazing. And it's because of this regenerative work of the Spirit that we have been placed into the family of God. 
my relationship with God dynamically changed through faith in his son. Before I made the decision to trust Christ, God was my judge. But now he's my father. He's my father. I've been placed into his family. (laughs) I didn't plan on that. By the way, that landed on Father's Day. Pretty sweet, huh? Pretty sweet. William McDonald writes in his book, here's the difference, the following quote. Once a birth has taken place, it lasts forever. You can't go back and undo it. A relationship is formed that can't be altered. There's something final about birth, isn't there? Um, You can't undo a birth. A physical birth can be stalled. I was scheduled to come out of the womb on May 16. Four days later, I I was born, May, May 20. I waited a bit. But my relationship with my parents did not change, even though I, I waited right, a couple of days. My relationship with them did not change. Our relationship with the Lord does not change. The moment you trust Christ as Savior, your relationship with him does change. For the believer in Christ, a new relationship has been formed. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7 says, Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. I love what John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. He, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God. At one time, an enemy of God, rejecting his free offer of salvation, to now having a, a new position in Christ. These are objective truths for the believer based upon the promises of God through his word. And that leads us to the fifth aspect that's connected to the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, and that is its connection to saving faith. Its connection to saving faith. When, when Charles Ryrie defined regeneration, listen carefully to what he, what he says about faith and, and regeneration and how the two correlate. He says, regeneration is that which begins the new life. It's the new birth. Faith is not strictly the means of regeneration, although it is the human requirement which, when met, enables the Spirit, to bring about the new birth. Though faith is closely associated with the new birth, the two ideas are distinct, the one being the human responsibility and channel, and the other, the work of the Holy Spirit. So when it comes to to this work of regeneration, we have very clearly seen through Titus chapter 3, verse 5, as well as John chapter 3, verse 8, that it is, in fact, a work of the Holy Spirit. And I believe Ryrie is correct in his assessment of this divine work and this human response, the divine work being regeneration, the human response is faith. The two are closely connected, but they're not the same. When does regeneration take place? We might say that uh, when is a, a person born again? That might be the question we would ask. The answer is at salvation. At salvation. Well, what is the one condition that needs to be met by a sinner to receive that new status into the family of God. What is that condition? Believe, Believe, right? That's it. It's believe. And some have thought that, that regeneration actually transpires after someone places their faith in Christ. But this is simply not what Scripture teaches. When the Philippian jailer asked in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, the question of how it is that a person can be right with God, his, questions, his question was, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas don't say nothing, right? Nor do they say, you need to regenerate. (laughs) What do they say? What is the condition? Believe. It's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what? You will, by the way, be saved, you and your household, if you would make that decision to believe in Christ. So the single condition for the jailer was believe. We might say, say, trust Christ. This deals with simple faith in the Savior. The jailer's responsibility wasn't to save himself, According to Titus chapter 3, verse 5, that's God's responsibility. It, uh, it is what Pastor David Thompson refers to as the, this grace age package. I like that. This grace age package of salvation. I love what he, what he says about this. He says, when regeneration is analyzed as being a total work of God, and when saving faith is seen as a gift of God, it seems logical that saving faith and regeneration are part of one divine package which occurs at the moment of salvation. There is a moment when in the mind of God, a person is transformed from being a child of darkness into a child of light, a child of damnation into a child of everlasting life. 
This moment, in God's mind, is the moment of regeneration in which he imparts new spiritual life to one spiritually dead. This moment occurs at the instant of salvation. This isn't only logical, but it's what the scripture teaches. It is biblical to say that saving faith and regeneration are part of one divine package. Though separate in function, saving faith functions as a choice that the sinner must make. You and I have a choice before us today. What will you do with Jesus Christ? You have that choice. You can choose to reject him as your savior to save you from your sin, or you can accept him as your savior. Regeneration functions by the, by the Holy Spirit. Well, as we've seen today, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit is of utmost importance to mankind. It imparts new life to individuals who were once lost and in sin and separated from God. This work is a responsibility that rests solely with God. It cannot be earned or deserved by any human effort. The process of regeneration is spiritual in nature. It is not physical. It leads to a new and intimate relationship with God. This relationship is, is rooted in saving faith, which is intricately connected to the work of regeneration. Although the two concepts are closely related, they are distinct. Which brings us to the main truth that we see in regard to regeneration, which is this. Regeneration, it refers to the spiritual rebirth that takes place in a person's life through the work of the Holy Spirit. We see regeneration in the New Testament, in this grace age for the, for the believer in Christ. You don't see anywhere in the scripture the unregenerative work of the Holy Spirit. It's not there. It's important for believers to understand the significance of this. Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, when commenting on the riches of regeneration, I like what he said. It's, and he's referring here in the context to the work of regeneration, its full extent and value will be seen not on earth or in time, but in glory and for all eternity. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day. We certainly do see some of its results today. My life has been changed by the gospel, and if it weren't for the gospel, this church building wouldn't be here today. We have a glimpse here into the extent and, and value of regeneration, but it is only a shadow of what is to come. There are still more who need to hear the gospel and who need to respond to it by faith. Now, if saving faith functions as a choice that the sinner must make and regeneration functions by the Spirit of God, then the question that you should ask yourself in light of this divine work is this. Have I been born again? That's the question. Have I been born again? Friend, the question is, who are you trusting in to be right with God? Are you trusting in yourself, your own works, or are you trusting in the one who did all the work for you when he went to the cross, paid for your sin in full, died on the cross, rose again three days later, who offers life to any who would believe in him? Make that decision today. Scripture says you will be saved if you would make that decision. So what are you waiting for? For the rest of us, uh, let's take time this week. Again, this shouldn't be a point in Sunday school class. <laughs> this is rich. We've been saved by his grace. We need to reflect on that this week. We need to remember that and rejoice in that. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. I want to thank you for this rich truth that at that moment when we made that decision to trust Christ as Savior, we were placed into your family and given new life. We thank you for those truths. I pray that we would think about and dwell on those truths this week. We don't ever have to worry about losing our salvation. We thank you for that as well. Father, if any is, are listening online and they've never made that decision to trust you as Savior, I pray that they would in this moment make that decision and be saved. And we will give you praise for that. In your name we pray. Amen.